Another member of staff is a former pupil who went on to find success in two separate careers, one as a chef and the other as a rock star. Cowboy Mac Bell is on the left as lead singer with the Joe Perry Project. James Brown says, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Just open up the door and I'll get it myself. That's my philosophy. Uh, I try to help maintain uh, the music rooms, show people where the door to the music room is, get them in there, and then I kind of stand back. And Loss of familial slash parental slash friend support is another thing that can really, really suck. There are definitely family members in my family who disagree with unschooling very, very vehemently. Let them get it themselves. This is a place where the teachers don't do it for you. There's no workbook to follow. It's really learning in the trenches which more and more with the, the kind of new, new business and, and new uh, possibilities out there, it, it's a great experience, it's a real experience. No, I never wanna break off from you. Next to the music rehearsal. And that can be a real challenge to feel like your own family, your own extended family is really against what you're doing with your life. Number nine is problems within the unschooling community itself. There seems to be this notion among some unschoolers, although of course not all, it's a big community. In a world of school, reading and writing are taught somewhat differently. Uh, the conventional wisdom in public schools is to introduce reading as early as possible. And I can understand the reasoning behind that because it is a fact that children who read well later on uh, do better in high school, they do better in college, and reading is an essential skill. Literacy is one of our main tasks in education. There are a lot of different people in it, but there seems to be this notion sometimes that successful unschoolers do a certain thing, like travel the country or find a cure for cancer or like, I don't know, live on a boathouse in the Great Lake or something crazy and awesome like that. But the solution that many educators today employ is actually counterproductive because they introduce reading and writing so early that the children are not able to experience the fullness and they're not able to really develop the full understanding and comprehension that's necessary. It can be a real stress to have it feel like your own community is judging what you're doing and whether or not you're successful. Another problem within the unschooling community is one person speaking for all the rest of unschoolers. Sometimes one person within the community will have a very loud voice and I think it can be a problem when that person speaks about unschooling because unschooling is a really different journey for everyone and everyone experiences it very differently. And when one person speaks on behalf of all unschoolers, sometimes it doesn't reflect what I personally want to show to the public. After four years of St. John's, what in the world are you going to do with an education where you haven't learned something in particular? I'm a nuclear engineer at Los Alamos National Laboratory. I'm an architect. I'm the general counsel of the President's Council on Bioethics. I'm a cancer research physician at the City of Hope Cancer Center. I'm an interior designer. I'm the host of World of Opera for National Public Radio in Washington. I'm a lawyer in New York City. I'm a writer, producer, and director of film and television. I am a minister. Editorial writer and columnist with the New York Post. I'm a high school English and math teacher. I a similar yet kind of unrelated problem is media coverage. Uh, there have been some really nasty articles about unschooling that uh, have surfaced, and that, that's always, that, that always is a terrible feeling, to have a part of yourself that is so intrinsic sort of shown to the public in such a negative way, as it usually is in these articles. And number 10 is uh, a little bit similar to one of the past points, is uh, expectation to do great things. Um, from society and or community. Sometimes being a successful unschooler just means living a pretty ordinary life. It doesn't necessarily mean going out and doing amazing things. It, it's whatever you want it to be. And they plateau. In my experience, many children plateau in their reading skills in, in public schools. So what happens in a Waldorf system is that the reading and writing is prepared in the early childhood work but mostly through play and through problem solving and, and engagement. And in first grade, then uh, the letters are introduced through pictures and through stories. And I think that can be something that's difficult even for me to keep in mind sometimes, is that just because I'm not 
doing these grand and amazing things doesn't mean that I'm failing at being an unschooler. With all that said, I just wanted to return to what I said in the beginning of the video, which is that unschooling is fantastic and amazing and I love it, and if these are the ten biggest problems I can find with it, I feel like I'm doing pretty good. If anybody- I'm a physician in infectious disease and internal medicine. I'm the senior vice president and manager of municipal bonds for Oppenheimer funds. I'm a named inventor on over 150 filed applications and about 37 issued patents. I'm a... If anybody has any questions or comments or other things to say, uh, you can feel free to put them in the comments department below and uh, I will do my best to get back to you and answer and maybe answer if you guys have a lot of questions, maybe answer in another video. So thanks for watching and goodbye. It's been a long time since I've made a video. I miss this. Ouch. So to speak briefly, the letter M, rather than simply placing that M on the blackboard and saying this is the M, let's think of words that begin with M. The Monday lesson in a Waldorf school might begin with a story that features mountains. I know you blew out your knee playing in college. It's tough giving up a dream and starting over, but I'm glad to hear you're interested in the coaching position, Mr. Haskins. Uh, McCarty here says you're a winner. I sure appreciate that. Now, my style of coaching is one that well, I... You played for Mr. Iba, so you're not arranging in these unruly boys. Uh, sir, I do believe in discipline. Now, my basketball philosophy is... Mr. Haskins, discipline. you know, we're a small school, and we can't pay very much. So we're going to need you to live in the men's dorm with your family and uh, keep those boys in line over there. But your meals are free, the cafeteria, and you got uh, plenty of Texas sunshine. So how's it sound? Yeah, that's what it takes to coach Division I basketball. And <laughs> that's all right with me. 1783, while negotiating the final peace treaty with England, Industrious even at age 78, the former printer was taken aback by the late-to-bed, late-to-rise habits of the French aristocracy, who burned expensive candles into the wee hours and wasted the free light of the morning sun. So he had the idea, and it was actually a serious idea, to kind of shift the working hours in the summer where you wouldn't need to burn so many candles at night. Take a look around you. This ain't Kansas, Duke, Kentucky. We're a poor school that counts every penny to pay for the Rio Grande River Rats dream of a college education. We're lucky to put a decent team on the court. Well, decent don't cut it with me. Boy, that's where you want to go. Hey there, big man. How you doing? Don Haskins, Texas Western. How you doing? Don Haskins, Texas Western. But Franklin's idea of changing the clock to save fuel wouldn't take hold until World War I as Europe grappled with the high cost of fuel. In America, an extra hour of daylight was enacted year-round for the duration of the Second World War. Congress called the policy Daylight Saving Time. See anyone you like? What about number three over there? Jason Stevens out of Chicago. 18 points a game. Hasn't signed a letter in 10 yet. Jason! Beating a dead horse there, Don. Jason, Don Haskins, Texas Western. Western Union. Now, Texas Western down in El Paso. Hey, after the game, when you get a minute, I'd like to talk to you about playing for him. Play for you at Texas Western? Thanks, coach, but I'm partial to winning. In the post-war years, daylight saving time gradually shifted into its current spring to autumn slot. It may be impossible to calculate the amount of fuel it saved over the decades, but a study during the 1970s oil crunch found that one extra hour of daylight saved the equivalent of 10,000 barrels of oil per day. Surely Ben Franklin would have approved. How about that big old tall boy? Made all of Jayhawk Conference last year. I'm gonna sign with Kansas. Weathermen. However, Franklin did something really ingenious when it comes to understanding how storms travel across North America. One night in 1743, 
Franklin was preparing to watch a lunar eclipse, but his view was obscured by a storm. Up until Franklin's time, it was assumed that storms blew in from the northeast. Even the name nor'easter is used because that's the way the wind comes down towards New England and into Pennsylvania when there's a storm. He was surprised to read in the newspapers that the people in Boston saw this eclipse perfectly well. Talk to Bobby Joe Hill. Son, you can't win playing nigger ball. I mean, sure, they can jump, but they can't lead. Can't handle the pressure. Don't have enough intelligence. That boy in particular. You know what kind of smart mouth. Just tell me where I can find him. So what he did was he wrote to all of his correspondents up and down the Atlantic seaboard. By charting their responses, Franklin was able to determine that the storm had actually moved from southwest to northeast. He then theorized, correctly, that the movement of weather is controlled by differences in air pressure. Most people today view that particular um, discovery as the foundation of modern meteorology. Are you scared? No, yes, sir. sir. I know someone who's not scared. Larry Connolly here is not scared. We don't teach scared at the University of Kentucky. I need you to be standing there waiting for him when they come out of this timeout. Standing there waiting for him like a force, like a wall. Don't let that guy crowd you. Get him out of there. This is the national championship. Are you surprised? They come to play. So we got to play back. We know how to play this game better than anybody living. Play the game. Let's go. Franklin would publish some of the first weather and climate forecasts in his Poor Richard's Almanac. He also wrote with surprising accuracy about global climate change. During the unusually cold and foggy summer of 1783, he may have been the first to connect climate change with atmospheric pollution when he correctly linked the cool weather to a volcanic eruption that had taken place in Iceland several months earlier. Excuse me, I'm the basketball coach down at Texas Western. I'd like to talk to you about playing for me there. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm done playing this game. You'll hardly put me on the floor tonight. Yeah, I'm offering a full scholarship. Uh-huh. You sign me up like your token Negro, bury me at the end of the bench. I'd rather hang it up, do something else. I'd be the next Smokey Robinson. I might even run for president. Franklin even speculated about the effect of deforestation on the planet's climate. In the 21st century, as global warming threatens to redraw our climate zones, climatologists are closely watching the Gulf Stream, the warm Atlantic Ocean current that brings temperate weather to northern Europe. Not surprisingly, it was the father of meteorology, Ben Franklin, who first mapped the Gulf Stream. You got a real talent, son. Why throw it away? I'll tell you why. Ever since I was a kid, only loved one thing. That was playing ball. Do you understand what that's like to have that ball in your hand? It's like, it's like making sweet music with your game. Only thing is, you don't want to hear the song. You talk a good game, Hill. I didn't come here to find a player I could sit on the bench. I intend to start you. Start NCAA Division I ball. What is it with you, mister? I've accepted it. What are you smoking? Franklin first heard of this warm current in the 1760s from whaling captains, including his cousin, Timothy Folger. On his many transatlantic journeys, Franklin painstakingly measured ocean temperatures. When he'd go across the ocean, he'd take a barrel and he'd lower it into the ocean. It had a valve so he could measure the temperature of the water at each depth because he wanted to see how deep the Gulf Stream went, not just where it went. I 
ain't smoking nothing, son. Now you just told me about a big old dream you have. I can let you play. I can help you make your dream come true faster than a twist will take your socks off. In 1768, Franklin and Timothy Folger unveiled their chart, along with the name Gulfstream. And that chart has held up amazingly well, orbiting spacecraft in our own day.